In a previous video I did about the Carthaginian voyage of Hanno into West Africa, some of you took issue with the illustrations used throughout the video, and I can certainly understand that, as Carthage is largely promoted as a Mediterranean civilization throughout popular culture, and many don't want that narrative to take more precedence than it already has. But your inquiries did get me thinking about Carthaginian civilization in general. I began to realize I never really investigated or studied Carthage like I've done for other African civilizations. So today, based on my own research, I wanted to give us a foundation from which we can understand Carthaginian civilization. And through this, hopefully we can find out if Carthage would be considered a so-called black civilization. <laughs> What up African world, it's home team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and supporting this content. If you'd like access to full courses and sources, or you simply want to show your support, you may do so by clicking the Patreon link in the description box below. Even though the terminology of black is a little outdated, for the purposes of this video and for simplicity, I'm going to have to use it. The way I define black or black civilization is mostly through a western point of view. So the term in general will be defined as having a close relationship or origin with the people we would consider black today in the Caribbean or the Americas. For me, Carthage was never really on my radar because to be honest, I just never found it interesting. That might sound like blasphemy to some African history enthusiasts, but I just never really cared for it. I can't give you a concrete reason, but my closest guess is that perhaps I just never truly understood its history. I don't know. I think the best way to answer the question on the demographics of Carthage is to study the history of North Africa in general. North Africa has the most unique history on the continent because there's not only so much we don't know about it, but because the desertification of North Africa over time drastically impacted its history. Personally, I break up North African history into three periods to help me understand it better. There is prehistoric North Africa, ancient North Africa, and then medieval. I know prehistoric and ancient can be considered the same thing, but I separate them because again, the desertification of North Africa affected its history so much. Prehistoric North Africa was a time when the entire region was flourishing with wildlife, trees, grass, and even rivers. We know about this because of prehistoric wall paintings. Now, from my research, the majority of prehistoric North Africa seems to have been populated by people groups we would consider black today, or ethnic groups indistinguishable from Africans we would see today in, say, Senegal or Nigeria. The biggest evidence we have affirming this are the wall paintings they left behind. The absolutely devastating event of North African desertification seems to have greatly affected the lives of prehistoric populations as they were displaced and had to move further south. There are many oral histories from Africans who are now below the Sahara who say they originally came from a region further in the north. In this discussion, it's important to consider prehistoric North African populations because they continue to be a forgotten presence throughout the history of the region. After the desertification, we get more into what I would consider ancient North Africa. Unfortunately, putting a timeline on the desertification isn't easy and certainly not exact, so I'll refrain from doing so. But one of the more prominent peoples of North African civilization outside of Nubia or Egypt were the Garamanti peoples, who were brought to our attention through literature around 500 BC. But in all likelihood, they were a group of people who existed in the Sahara much earlier, perhaps around 1000 BC. From the onset, the Garamanti people are seen as being diverse in phenotype. Now, we can't say for certain that prehistoric North Africa was more phenotypically uniform, but there's no doubt that by the time of the Garamantes, North Africa was very phenotypically diverse, at least more so than the rest of Africa. The physical appearance of the Garamantes has been observed and commented on frequently by Greeks and Romans. Even though the records can be a little confusing, as some commenters associate the Garamantes as being Ethiopians, aka black people, and others distinguished them from the Ethiopians. This merely confirms the fact that the Garamantes were indeed diverse. 
There seems to have been little difference between Garamanti civilization and modern Amazigh populations throughout North Africa. I believe that the issue of Garamanti demographics is important because it can be seen as a model for a Carthaginian civilization. Even though Carthage had received migration and foreign influence from outside of Africa, that prehistoric base still seems to have been present. I'll get to that in a minute, but let's talk about Carthaginian civilization as a whole. Carthage began as a Phoenician colony in the 9th century BC around modern day Tunisia. Now many speak about the diversity of the Phoenicians as well. Their exact origin still isn't clear, but most agree that they came from the Levant region. But it continues to be an ongoing debate, because Herodotus tells us something that we simply can't ignore concerning the origin of the Phoenicians. This is what Herodotus has to say. This nation, according to their own account, dwelt anciently upon the Raytheian Sea, but crossing thence fixed themselves on the sea coast of Syria, where they still inhabit. So essentially Herodotus is telling us that according to Phoenician oral history, they may have been Africans from the Horn who migrated to the Levant region. Now even if this is true, that the Phoenicians were originally Africans, they still would have intermingled with the populations they encountered in the Levant, diversifying their group. Regardless, this history concerning Phoenician origins is what causes a lot of controversy when it comes to the Africanness of Carthage, if you will. Now, even though the Phoenicians founded Carthage, it was the Libyans in Africa who largely peopled the area and played a dominant role in the development of its civilization. And the ancient population of Libya is yet another exhausting and confusing topic, as there seems to be diversity as well. So from the very beginning, Carthage takes on various people groups from the Phoenicians and the Libyans who at their core seem to be diverse. Also, we can't neglect the people groups who were already there before the arrival of Phoenicians and Libyans, perhaps mostly ancient Amazigh populations and other ethnic groups that may have reflected the realities of the former prehistoric population. But in order for this video to have any value in the diaspora, I must talk about the evidence about the argument for a so-called Black Carthage. When scholars from various fields began studying some skeletal remains of ancient Carthaginians, they found something interesting. They found the remains of the highly venerated priestess of Tanit, the most ornate and the most artistic sarcophagus found. Professor Eugene Pittard had this to say about the discovery. The woman buried there had Negro features. She belonged to the African race. This discovery was pretty fascinating because religious figures held a lot of power in ancient societies. Thus, this black priestess, whoever she was, was certainly among the elite class within Carthage. Now, of course, the discovery of one black woman cannot reflect the entire populace. So what other evidence exists? Well, Professor Stefan Gassel apparently conducted a study on Carthaginian skeletons and he declared that the so-called Semitic type characterized by the long, perfectly oval face, the thin alkaline nose, and the lengthened cranium enlarged over the nape of the neck has not yet been found in Carthage. That's a pretty strong statement. Now assuming the skeletal remains of the Carthaginians were dated before the Roman and Vandal occupation, the previous comments by these professors no doubt challenge popular culture's view of Carthaginian demographics. But even though we haven't found the so-called Semitic type in Carthage according to Professor Cassell, that still doesn't mean that black people were the predominant in Carthage. The previous evidence for Phoenician and later Libyan dominance of Carthage married with the comments from the professor seems to prove what we've always seen throughout ancient North African history, which is a pretty diverse model. The big difference seems to be the status black people maintained in Carthage, because the image of black people has been so tarnished over time. Anytime we look at ancient history, we immediately assume the presence of black people in highly civilized areas must have been slaves or held subservient positions. I think we can say with confidence that this was not at all the case in Carthage. As we can see from the remains of a high priestess, black people were very much a part of elite Carthaginian civilization. The question alone about the ethnic persuasion of Hannibal Barca 
the greatest ruling figure Carthage had ever known, is clear indication concerning the significance and or presence of the black Carthaginian elite. The elephant in the room when it comes to Carthage has always been Hannibal Barca's ethnicity. Even the black men no doubt present in Hannibal's army has been controversial because the persistent image of black people in elite positions within preeminent ancient civilizations does not sit well with our society today. Was Hannibal a black man and therefore a reflection of the greatest black elite dynasty within Carthaginian civilization? An honest answer to that question is no one really knows for sure, because scholars cannot confirm with certainty the existence of any authentic images of him. However, the strongest evidence we may have concerning an actual depiction of the great Hannibal Barca comes from the coin of Trasimeno. The Western world will consistently present to you about three images or so that they believe are portraits of Hannibal. Unfortunately, they present these images without much context. All three of these images have a sort of Mediterranean look, and according to Francis Polsky, a noted iconographer, the popular bust of Hannibal is not of Hannibal at all, but simply the ideal representation of a hero. The best chance of actually having a general idea of Hannibal's physical features are from coins. There currently exist about eight coins that may be associated with Hannibal himself, but the coin that creates the greatest stir is the coin of Trasimeno. Most coins that are promoted as being from the Barca family are ultimately representations of Punic gods and are often not meant to be representations of the Barca family phenotype. Before I get into this coin, it's important to understand that I'm not making the argument that this coin is of Hannibal. I'm making the argument that there is no reason why this coin should be ignored as it is in popular and scholarly spaces. The discovery of this coin and others like it are very inconvenient. It was discovered in Italy dated about 217 BC in the vicinity of Lake Trasimeno after Hannibal defeated the Romans there. Now some make the claim that Hannibal never minted coins in Italy, but that simply isn't the case. He did issue an electrum coinage in Capua, Italy, and so a history of him doing so exists. After his victory at Trasimeno and the discovery of the Trasimeno coin, the obvious conclusion is that either the coin is a depiction of a Punic god or the victor himself, Hannibal. The coin is likely not a depiction of an elephant driver because the elephant depicted on the coin is an Indian elephant and the sole surviving elephant of Hannibal after he crossed the mountains was an Indian, one that Hannibal rode on himself. And so the implications speak for themselves and creates a narrative that's in complete opposition to what popular culture promotes. However, as of late, it seems as though that's beginning to change slightly with the more recent depiction of Hannibal as a black man in the History Channel series called Barbarians Rising. So what am I trying to say? Well, Carthage, upon further review, was a typical North African civilization, one that was obviously diverse. To make an absolute statement about its status of being a black civilization only depends on what sources you decide to put more weight into, but I think a proper historical perspective will lead you to ask different questions rather than make absolute statements. Questions like, what kind of role did black people have in Carthaginian civilization? And given the evidence we've collected today, I think the answer is a significant one. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.